Once Upon a Time. Welcome to Australian Book Lovers, your destination for imagination. A big warm welcome to everybody and a huge thank you for joining us once again for the Australian Book Lovers podcast. Our mission, as always, is to bring fabulous Australian and Indigenous literature spanning a whole range of genres to book lovers all around the globe, as well as fantastic resources and information for passionate authors looking to write their next bestseller. I am Darren Kazanko, science fiction and horror author, reader, and one of your hosts and co-founder of the Australian Book Lovers, and I am coming to you today from Corner Country. And I am Veronica Strachan, fantasy, memoir, and picture book writer, reader, and your other co-founder and host, and coming to you today from Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung Country. And not only that, we are both coming to our audience from, I guess, it's as 20 count as adulthood being that we are officially well, podcast episode number 20. Well, no, I think we probably have to wait till 21. Oh, that's we are right, in course. our second decade. So, yes, yes. yes. yeah. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Yeah, we're going to have to do something special for 21 then. I mean, usually you get the key. So yep. uh, we'll do maybe a virtual key somehow. But yes, episode yes. 20. And uh, look, we had a huge episode 19. And already we've got a, a you know, huge amount of entertainment and fun ahead for this episode. Absolutely. It, there's, it's so much fun researching and preparing for the episode as much as it is going back to listen to the interview and so much going on. And I'm not sure whether listeners will be able to hear, but it's now just begun bucketing down here in the Macedon Ranges. Uh, so if you can hear thunder on the tin roof, yeah, that's what's happening. Yes. Well, look, I mean, obviously, uh, sound effects, sometimes we try and edit them out and sometimes you can't avoid that. However, I was just thinking, you know, we live in a land of often dusty plains too here in Australia. So yes. we can maybe mark this one down, episode 20. If it comes summer when it's 48 degrees, it's bone dry, it's stinking hot. You can always <laughs> replay this episode and listen to the beautiful <laughs> sound the right. of rain on the roof. Yes. Um, and remember yes. those uh, days in June when the beanie was on and the Wellingtons had to be near the door. <laughs> and I had to turn the heater off and wrap myself in, uh, you know, uh, I've got a shawl on and I've got a, a little blankie around my knees to keep me toasty. But yes. Oh, okay. Well, my sister swears by electric uh, throw rug for her. Yeah, I think that you've told me that before and I think that is absolutely amazing. So uh, yeah, I might have to look into that, but it's only because we're recording. So there you go. Yeah, I've got a phobia of putting um cotton and electricity wrapped around me i don't yeah, know why i can't do electric yeah, blankets I can't yeah. oh do... no i can definitely do electric blankets <laughs> well but i did I, I once tried to invent a jacket which was based on you know the very futuristic concept of a hot water bottle ah. where you could pour it in and have the jacket lined with hot water but of course Ooh. that works mm. until it gets chilly and then of course yeah. it's twice as cold so but i'm sure it'll work i'm sure they're out there but none of them. Yeah. yeah well look Episode 20, I think we've yes. both got some fantastic news. So how about we jump straight to the news? Excellent. So let's start with a little bit of uh, books and publishing news. So again, fantastic site to have a bit of a look at books and publishing and I'm a member so I can dive in a little bit deeper, but just a couple of um, quick sort of uh, top headlines to have a look about is that the Miles Franklin 2021 shortlist has been announced. So that's a, a fairly uh, well-regarded literary prize. So the Miles Franklin is for a novel that's judged as being of the highest literary merit and which represents Australian life in any of its phases. So we've got six shortlisted novels. Um, that there's a long list of 12, and now we're down to the short list of six. So it's Amnesty by Aravind Adiga from Picador, The Rain Heron by Robbie Arnott. From that's Text an interesting Publishing. title. Yeah. At the Edge of the Solid World, Daniel Davis Wood from Brio. Labyrinth, Amanda Lowry, text publishing again. Uh, Luckies, uh, Andrew Pippos, uh, published by Picador, and The Inland Sea 
Madeline Watts, published by Pushkin Press. So each of those shortlisted winners gets $5,000 from the Copyright Agency's Cultural Fund. Remember that name? We'll talk about that more in a minute. Okay. And overall, the $60,000 prize is awarded then to the one the judges decide as being, uh, as I mentioned, that highest literary merit. So there Huge is, prizes. yeah, there is some great reward for uh, writing a really good book. <laughs> So readers will benefit from more literary prizes because authors are out there trying to do the very best and deliver, you know, great work that they have. So that's it. Miles Franklin is out. Excellent. And just qu quickly, did mm. you find it uh, similar to the way I sort of look at sometimes with, with a lot of these uh, contests for books, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it feels sometimes that uh, for, in a good way, of course, not in a bad mm. way, that titles that on their own may not become, you know, quote unquote, popular fiction in the sense of, you know, mainstream blockbuster, you know, bestsellers, mm -hmm. because they're often very, you know, they might have profound stories or, or maybe quite niche, but then when they go to these prestigious uh, awards or, or these prestigious contests, mm -hmm. the, the contests help illuminate these titles that, yeah. and then therefore something that may not have normally become popular has an opportunity to become popular. So yes. yeah, I think it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So at the complete other end of the spectrum from that uh, more, as you mentioned, that kind of, uh, not esoteric, that literary end, uh, there's some news that um, a young Australian uh, author has been, uh, her series, uh, Welbeck Flame, which is a children's imprint of a UK publisher, um, has acquired the UK and Commonwealth rights, except for Canada, to a middle grade series by the Australian author Sky McKenna. So this is fantastic. Um, there's a publisher, Felicity Alexander from Philippa Ma uh, Milnes Smith at the Soho Agency, trying to get everybody in there, as I should. Um, and it's going to be mar marketed and distributed by Alan and Unwin in Australia and New Zealand. So the reason I mention is that it is a, a middle grade and it's about an English village on the boundary between the human world and the fairy world, where young witches practice their craft and come face to face with cunning fairy folk. So a little bit more up my alley, perhaps, than um, some of the other uh, more contemporary or, or literary uh, books that are out there and that's without having read anything about those six short lists which I am going to do because I do like to have a look and see if there's one that might pick my uh, fantasy mm. and it's interesting because as a reader you look at the cover absolutely you judge the book by its cover we've we've talked about this before then you read the blurb and it's incredibly important that they get the right words on the back to pick up the right audience because if you get the blurb wrong and you're not telling the tale truly, then the wrong reader is going to try your book, be disappointed, leave a bad review and it kind of goes around in a circle. So, yes. uh, you know, that, that's why it is so important. And this is my beautiful segue. The Australian Society of Authors is about to, well, not about to, has announced their virtual literary speed dating for 2021. Oh, yes. We, Yes, we had a, a lovely chat with uh, Olivia Lanchester, the CEO from the Australian Society of Authors, uh, which will be coming up in a few episodes. Absolutely, but she yes. Did, and this was one, one of the things for you. So I'll leave people to go and have a look at asaauthors.org forward slash services, literary hyphen speed hyphen dating. But in, in short, it gives writers a three minute opportunity to pitch their completed manuscript to Australian publishers and agents. So this is about the blurb. This is about getting a pitch, which is a little bit different from a blurb because you you really have to tell the person you're pitching to the, the story. Whereas in a blurb, you keep people guessing and you might end with a question. Yeah, um, or a hint, yes. Or a hint. So how hard is it to condense, you know, for example, we've got you know a, about a, a 90 odd thousand word uh, book Family Secrets as part of our Beneath a Burning Heart series. And how hard is that to put it into three minutes or 50 words or whatever that is? So readers um, appreciate when the book speaks to them through those blurbs and that kind of thing. So if you want to have a practice, then uh, ASA also has a pitch perfect course. And there are four sessions and that, uh, you know, gives you lots of very helpful education on how to think about how do you want to publish a book uh, even if you don't want to go the traditional publishing route you might want to go self-publishing you still have to get those words right you still have to be able to have that pitching conversation with 
people that you meet in the street or when you're at a writer's uh, festival, all those kind of things. So I was, I was yeah. going to say that exact same thing. Look, re regardless of uh, the scenario, at the end of the day, you know, wh wh how you publish, where you publish, at the end of the day, the very first marketing tool you're going to have is chatting to other people. Yeah. And look, it is, a, it is a tricky one. So, you know, I say, oh, do you write? Do you? Oh, yes, I do write or whatever, however the conversation yeah. might come about. Oh, yeah. what's your book about? Oh, and that is sometimes, you know, you need to be able to, it'd be so great to have, you know, one or two well thought out, but very short uh, bite-sized descriptions that you can have in your little tool belt, which is essentially your marketing tool belt. Mm. And then if somebody says, that sounds fascinating, tell me more, then you can open the floodgates and go for it. But yeah, yes. that, that uh, one or two minutes. And because yeah. I'm definitely going to look into doing that because that, yes. it will take the pressure off if anybody says, oh, what's your book about? Exactly. It's like, oh, easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's about a man and a dog. Out it goes. That's it. <laughs> That's right. So it's fantastic. All right. One more from uh, the world of uh, publishing festivals and prizes, etc. So the Liminal and Pantera Press Nonfiction Prize 2021 um, is open at the moment. Just wanted to mention submissions are from the 1st of May till the 1st of July. The winner gets $10,000, the runner up 2000 nice. which is good. So the the prize is, uh, the, this year's prize is for First Nations writers and writers of colour and it calls for writing on the theme of archive so uh, have a look under uh, liminalmag.com forward slash prizes hyphen fellowships and you'll see um, all the information there so 4,000 words that addresses the idea of archive in its grand capacity so they're not merely sites where knowledge is retrieved, but sites where knowledge is produced. So I won't read the whole thing, but it's it's fascinating. And if I was a great short story, as we know, I have trouble writing short. Um, I might, um, you know, just have a little practice, uh, you know, not being uh, in a First Nations person or a person of colour. At this point, I wouldn't be eligible, but entering these kind of competitions, looking at those prizes are incredibly good for your writing skills. All of that benefits readers and so if readers are looking for um you, you know looking to support our first nation writers or uh, writers of color or a particular genre of writers then looking at where those prizes are and looking at their short lists long lists is often a really good way to get a new to be read list and to be able to have a look and see uh, somebody a little bit different than what you would see just in the bestsellers, which is, as we know, you know, the, the big four publishers um, are able to market theirs fairly extensively. But if you want a little bit more broader reading, try some of those short lists from the prizes. That's yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Use it as a treasure chest hunt. Yes. Uh, you can find some amazing treasures and, uh, or even perhaps authors that you might want to look into further, you know, through all these short lists of, uh, you know, prestigious or really good um, book contests. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that. And uh, I, look, I'm going to be honest, uh, you, you did mention one of the shortlist titles earlier was Labyrinth, and now I've got Jennifer Connolly and uh, there's a Bowie <laughs> spiked hair in, in the back of my yeah. mind because I always thought that was crazy head. <laughs> it was, but yeah, it's a really good movie. I've got to admit, I've watched that sometime during the four month lockdown that we had when I was desperate just to not do anything else. Um, and it hasn't aged that badly. It's still pretty good. Um, you know, Jim Henson and his puppets were pretty fabulous. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> if anything, Labyrinth probably fits along that line of being between the edge of the uh, physical world and the land of fairies and what yes. that you mentioned before. One of the other segue. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, I've got a little bit of news uh, yep. regarding a uh, similar thing, uh, regarding a couple of online or con not contests, but events, should I say, uh, making use of two of our wonderful industry guests previously, and that is Vic Riders and Taz Riders. Mm hmm. Um, so yes, so and of course I have some fantastic books that I'd like to spotlight. So I'm going to jump straight to it because we've still got wonderful uh, guests to to talk about who who's yes. going to be uh, yeah. interviewed today. But nonetheless, I shall start with which I think is a really important, uh, I guess, the subject that uh, anybody in in publishing or anybody writing should uh, at least have some sort of understanding or at least have a little bit of look into it. So mm -hmm. this is regarding a seminar that's going to be held by none other than Kate Cuthbert, who we were so ah, graciously uh, given yes. time and on, on one of our previous industry episodes. And so this is an online seminar and now it is called Lunchtime Bites, Predatory Publishing versus Supported Independent Publishing, How to Spot the Scams. Yes. So now this is going to be on the 16th of July and it's scheduled from 12 to 1 p.m. 
And I do understand that is online. So yep. in theory, anybody can attend from anywhere, which is really good. Now, with regards to a little bit of a description, uh, it says that with so many publishing options open to writers, it can be really confusing to navigate how to get your work out there. So this workshop will help define predatory publishing and identify red flags so that you can make informed decisions about your manuscript. And uh, again, so the seminar will place, take, sorry, take place online and detailed instructions for participation will be provided. So assuming, you know, when you jump on and, and register your interest, I, I'm guessing. But anyway, so you will learn the difference between commercial publishing, predatory publishing, supported independent publishing and self-publishing, how to identify which type of publishing you are interested in, how to identify predatory publishers before it's too late, and when you can be expected to contribute money towards your publication and when you shouldn't. And of course, if uh, anybody hasn't had the opportunity yet to listen to our special industry edition podcast featuring Kate, then a little bit of information includes that Kate Cuthbert is program, Cuthbert, sorry, is program and partnerships manager at Writers Victoria. Previously, she worked for over a decade in trade publishing, notably initiating Harlequin, Australia's escape publishing imprint and serving as managing editor for seven years. She is an award-winning book review on critic and is pursuing a PhD examining Australia popular fiction. So you are in very good hands when it comes to learning some very valuable tools about predatory publishing and just those mind minefields and pitfalls that need to be navigated. Yes, and uh, I'm already booked into that one. Oh, there you go. Yes. <laughs> 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 and look, I've been stung, and I'm sure the many a writer out there has uh, either been stung or at least come close to being stung. Oh, uh, yeah. And you know, you, you learn as you go, of course. So yes. Uh, but oh boy, I wish I had the opportunity to do one of these. Fifteen. Before years ago. I know, I was so naive and so trusting. What was I thinking? Yes, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> now the other uh, fantastic event that's part of Writers Victoria is that I'd like to highlight is Story Bones Boot Camp. And so now this is going to be held on the 17th of July to the 18th of July. So uh, I'm assuming it, now it doesn't actually say whether it's purely online or whether it's in-house as well. So I guess a matter of jumping on the website, having a bit look further. But now this is basically, uh, so Storybones Bootcamp is a seminar or event where you will learn how to build a solid foundation for your story, premise, characters, circumstances, setting, themes, and obviously how they interact. You'll also learn how to interrogate your ideas so that it's rich, original, and can engage, sustain, and inspire your readers, how to shape the narrative arc of your story, as well as the individual story arc of each of your key characters, and the value of internal, external, and universal conflicts and how they interact, and finally, the lines that your characters can't cross and then do. Mm. And that is going to be uh, hosted by Erin Redden. Now, Erin mm -hmm. has had fiction and nonfiction published and her new literary crime novel, The Serpent's Skin, comes out in March 2021, followed by Deep in the Forest in 2022. She's Can been I go, ooh, 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 because she lives up my way and I went to the launch of her book, The Serpent's Skin, ah. so I've got a signed copy. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Your beauty. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing well. You're yeah. doing well. <laughs> well, maybe this is the one. You have to add this one to your uh, calendar. Oh, yes. I, I have to be careful because I would go to everything. and I have to leave room to actually write. I'm, I'm a little bit addicted to learning, so I do have to be a bit careful. Well, I'd, I'd much rather be in the company of someone addicted to learning than some of those people I bump into that are addicted to unlearning. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> or that I have to watch in suit and ties in front of uh, microphones and cameras. Nonetheless, Erin uh -huh. uh -huh. uh, mm. has, has been a television producer, a commentator and a foreign correspondent for which she was awarded the prestigious Walkley Award. She has an MA in writing and has just submitted her PhD on Girl Warriors in YA fiction at La Trobe University, where Yahoo! she's also taught writing. So again, that will be a fantastic little fun venture. Mm -hmm. And that is Story Bones Bootcamp. And yeah, I think that's going to be centered a little bit around crime by the sounds of it too. Mm -hmm. So, but both of those can be found on the Writers Victoria website and definitely have a look there. There's a whole heap of events coming up. Um, so, you know, a whole wormhole to jump down and have a look. So whether you're it's a, great a book program. lover, yeah, book lover or a, a writer, there's, there's something for everybody there. So definitely have a look. And it's something to consider because I know that some people say, oh, I can't go back to uni and do a creative writing bachelor. I, I haven't got time to do that either. It's not something that I necessarily want to do. Uh, but there are many, many really practical, uh, short 
courses, single sessions that will give you little pearls of wisdom to work on your writing and even as readers to give you insight into what is in the writing that you're reading. And, and I think I mentioned before that I was been listening to um, Amy Kaufman uh, on writing and her little six minute treasures and I usually I'm listening to that when I'm going for a walk and I think oh damn I really need to rush home and quickly do that so you think six minutes would be not enough but there is always something to to learn and listen and people and she often learns and listens for other people that she sometimes gets on to um, you know drop in for special bits of her podcast as well so enjoy the courses you don't have to go to university you don't have to go to TAFE you can just do an online little thing that just opens you in different ways and gets your mind thinking about how you're reading or what you're writing yeah yeah of course and you're exactly right and you know for writers out there and myself included um, it, it's a great opportunity to pick those areas where you might want to just enhance you know, mm. when it comes to your skill set as a writer, or perhaps just discover, maybe it's an area that you've never looked into. Um, I think it, a little bit like music, like I don't want to sit down and take a guitar course, mm -hmm. you know, learn about chords or amplifiers or any of that. However, you know, because I've already spent a lot of time already in those, that world. However, you know, for example, one of my weak spots might be sweeping arpeggios. And mm -hmm. if I see a course on that, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'd love yeah, to improve yeah. my sweeping up edge, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which, which uh, actually, no, I don't really, because I think it's just showing off those things, but uh, they sound great. Uh, but do you know what I mean? It's just, you just, it's a great opportunity to just, uh, you know, keep your eye out and see, oh, actually, that's something I'd really like to uh, sharpen up when it comes to my, yeah. my writing. So, yeah, definitely. Yep. Now, moving down south a little bit to the wonderful Tasmania and Tas writers, um, they have a creative crime writing session with Yay. a tansy Raina roberts right. now let's have a look here um, now, i think she writes sci-fi too doesn't she tansy Raina roberts i'm pretty sure i've read something of hers but anyway go on well join <laughs> local author tansy Raina roberts who writes the cafe la femme mysteries as olivia day for this crime writing workshop whether you're into cozy mysteries or noir thrillers you'll plan and begin your own unique crime story design a detective create some crimes and get writing They'll discuss favourite crime writing styles and authors, run through methods of plotting a fictional crime as a group, and work on writing exercises to build up your individual stories. So, uh -huh. yeah, definitely sounds fantastic. So if you'd like to sharpen your crime skills, discover your crime skills, or just jump into the world of crime, but the good kind of crime, of course, uh, the creative crime... The Creative Crime Writing, there's a bit of a tongue twister, <laughs> with Tansy Rayner Roberts is going to be held on the 1st of July, and that's from 4 p.m. till 6 p.m. And now it shows us the location is 24 Davy Street, so I'm guessing maybe that's an in-house. However, yeah. you know, feel free to jump onto the Taz Riders website where you can absolutely look for a little bit more information. But there's lots happening down there, and but I'm going to move to a little bit of home here in South mm -hmm. Australia. Mm. So I know there's lots happening in Victoria and guess what? <laughs> there's lots happening in South Australia too. Ah, uh, there is too. And we do have the fabulous writers essay lined up to have a chat with us. So fear not, they'll be, they'll be represented too. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, the South Australia, the, sorry, I'm getting tongue twisted everywhere. The South, here we go. Try it again. South Australian <laughs> Writers' Centre are uh, presenting Think Tank, and that's in partnership with the City of Adelaide. Now, this is actually an ongoing thing. So uh, coming to you on the fourth Wednesday of each month is Writers Essays Think Tank. And what it means is you can get together with other writers in this informal space to discuss concepts, test plot lines, workshop a synopsis, and brainstorm and get feedback on your ideas in a fast-paced hour of creative construction. It's absolutely free, welcoming for all, but they do ask that you make some bookings just to ensure, obviously, for capacity is, is maintained at the right level. Mm -hmm. And that is called Think Tank. And once again, that's on the fourth Wednesday of each month. So, yeah, it's maybe a good opportunity to dip your toes in the uh, writer's essay water if, if you haven't uh, been to any of the events before. Mm. And it sounds pretty fun. So the next one is scheduled for June 23. And uh, as a, once again, that's on the fourth Wednesday of each month. And another fantastic presentation from the South Australian Writer Centre is an event called Emotionally Engaging Your Reader with Emma Viskich. Now, great prose, action and characters can all fall flat if readers don't care enough to keep turning the page. In this workshop with award-winning author Emma Viskich, 
expand your knowledge on one of the most important elements of writing a story, novel or memoir, creating that emotional connection your reader will remember for a long time to come. Now that is a general mission price of $50 and I'm assuming there's going to be uh, possibly some a discount for members. However, the date that is being held is June the 29th. And once again, that is online. So if that's something that you may want to include in your arsenal of the literary skills, definitely jump onto the South Australian Writers website and have a bit of a look. It's one of the many events coming up. And that one is called Emotionally Engaging Your Reader, which of course is, I hope, the goal of every writer. Yes, most definitely. And talking about the 29th of June made me remember that if you are a writer and looking to make this your profession, please, I should pre uh, preface this with, I am not an accountant or, or a tax expert at all. However, these short courses, even that you pay small amounts for, are tax deductible in many cases. How about that? That's my, uh, you know, my um, quid pro quo. No, my caveat <laughs> is that, uh, see, I can't even say the right words, sorry. Um, I'll apologise to John, my accountant. Uh, but these courses are tax deductible. So as part of building your business of writing. No, that's right. I mean, we can't And the 30th be... of June, that's what it's all about. So if we listen, if people um, out of Australia are listening, um, our financial year ends on the 30th of June. So other countries do. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. But anyway, that's yeah. right. And that's good advice. And I was about to say, we can't all be um, politicians or ex Australian prime ministers that are so proud of our country that we store our money on offshore accounts through <laughs> very, very smoke and mirrored uh, accountants, because, you know, uh, most of us actually have integrity. And so, uh <laughs> therefore, what a fantastic way to, you know, yeah, make, make money work for you a little bit. So you're right. Have a look and a chat to an accountant or at least kick the receipt. And because yes. you never know what come in handy because it is <laughs> whether you're earning money or not yet from writing, if it's something you're pursuing, hey, why not? You yes. Know, it sounds a lot easier than, uh, yeah, getting offshore accounts, but the, well, that's, <laughs> that's for another story I'll write one day. <laughs> or a different podcast because yeah. we are here supporting <laughs> Australian authors and uh, introducing readers to some fabulous books. So you've got some spotlights for us, for our readers. Get your yeah. pencils ready. Here we go. Yes. Well, you know what? I'm going to start with, no, we've got a fantastic title called Once a Copper. And this is a, uh, you find this under our biography and it, Once a Copper is written by Vicky Petriatis. Now, fantastic little synopsis here. And as a true crime and crime, you know, lover when it comes to reading, this one sounds really good. I've read, read a lot of different uh, crime stuff, especially all the, you know, obviously all the Melbourne stuff. But anyway, mm -hmm. Once a Copper, Always a Copper. At least that's how it seems for Brian the Skull Murphy, long retired but sought out by a trail of journalists and cops who regularly beat a path to his door. Once known as Australia's toughest cop, the Skull was both charged with manslaughter and acquitted, then awarded a Valor Award for bravery in the line of duty. It is these two sides to the complex man that intrigue audiences to this day. A non-drinking Catholic family man, the skull didn't fit the 1950s police mould and often found himself on the outer among his colleagues. Dodging crooks and corruption on both sides of the thin blue line, the skull carefully cultivated a reputation for being a, quote, mad bastard. Over 40 men felt the sting of his bullets and many more felt the sting of his fists. But behind Australia's toughest cop lay a personal secret of sexual abuse which Murphy shares publicly for the very first time in the hope that it will help others. This abuse formed the kind of police officer he later became. Tough on the bad guys, but fiercely protective towards victims. Once a copper explores the many facets of the Skull story, starting on the main streets of South Melbourne to his early years as a policeman, then his fight against police corruption. No one was off limits to Skull Murphy, who used his street smarts to outwit the wiliest, should I say, of crooks. He formed enemies of an epic nature. Among them was great bookie robber Ray Chuck Bennett. Indeed, when Bennett was gunned down in broad daylight, Murphy was an early suspect. Bracket, he swears he was nowhere near the magistrate's court that day. End bracket. Notorious hitman Christopher Dale Flannery once had the skull in his sights, as did the infamous painters and dockers. He wore his unpredictability like a shield of steel and caught at unlikely informers like killer Dennis Allen. Now much has been written about the Skull's escapades, but few have explored the method behind the madness. And that is Once a Copper, Always a Copper uh, by Vicky Petriatis uh, that you can find under our biography and memoirs. Very good. I'm sure that's a name that's familiar to you coming from Victoria. No, 
Oh, not really the kind of circles I move in, Darren. <laughs> well, no, no, I don't mean <laughs> not somebody who let, hands you brown paper bags over a coffee yeah. uh, once a week. No, no I thought maybe uh, that I would know. No, no, because infamous name in crime over there. No, most of my working life was uh, deeply in the health sector. You know, running hospitals and and doing all of those kind of things. So no, not not much into the true crime. It's a little bit mm. scary. I mean, we often had the victims. I was uh, going to say you probably um, have customers. But, uh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. What else you got for me? Okay. Now I've got this one's a really cool mystery, and this one is called Crooked Vows by author John Watt. And again, you find that under our mystery uh, genres. Now, Crooked Vows reads as the following: Thomas, a twenty-three-year-old student priest, emerges alone from the wilderness four days after surviving a plane crash, but a missing woman's footprints are found with his near the crash site. What part did Thomas play in her disappearance? And why does he claim he can't remember? Sent to a psychiatrist by church authorities to recover his memories, Thomas's life and world unravel in ways he could never have foreseen, shaking the very foundations of his faith, his loyalty to the Catholic Church and the vocation he had chosen. Grappling with impossible expectations and burdened with guilt, the flawed characters show the consequence of oppressive rules colliding with impulses that can't be tamed. This compelling and timely novel explores the underpinnings of a deeply conservative Australian Catholic community in the 1950s, whose outward piety hides a shameful underbelly that dares not be exposed. And that is Crooked Vows, a uh, mystery by John Watt. Now that does sound pretty awesome. Mm. Very awesome, actually. And uh, now I don't know if it says that in this particular description, but it's actually set over in Western Australia. That, that yes. Book. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it does sound really intriguing. Uh, but, yeah, I think I might have to be uh, enjoying that, that read one at on one point. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now there's another one I'd like to uh, just introduce to everybody. And this one uh, is actually another one from our biography and memoir section. And this is called The Cherry Picker's Daughter. And mm. this one you can find under two listings, both our Indigenous uh, genre as well as our biography and memoir. And it is by uh, author Kerry Reed Gilbert, who unfortunately I understand is no longer with us. Um, but when it comes to The Cherry Picker's Daughter, this second edition of The Cherry Picker's Daughter is an exquisite portrait of growing up Aboriginal on the fringes of outback towns in New South Wales in the mid 20th century. It's an important book for school libraries and classrooms with profound insights into the extraordinary strength, resilience and ingenuity of Aboriginal families through families to overcome extreme poverty, persecution, racism, and cultural genocide. The strength of family ties in Aboriginal communities is clearly evident when three-month-old Kerry and her brother lost both parents. Her father, Kevin Gilbert, later become a famous activist and artist, killed their mother and was jailed for many years. Her father's sister, whom she always called mummy, raised Kerry and her brother, along with her own children and others within the extended family. The book is a tribute to this truly remarkable woman who not only loved them selflessly and worked tirelessly to support them, but also managed to keep them from being taken or stolen by the welfare. Mm. Told in the child's voice and in the vernacular of her mob, activist, artist, poet and author, Auntie Kerry tells her story of love and loss, of dispossession and repeated dislocation growing up in corrugated tin huts, tents and run down train carriages of helping her family earn an honest living through fruit picking and the impact of life as an Aboriginal state ward living under the terror of protection laws. Ultimately, it is a tribute to the power of family unity to overcome hardship and provide a tower of strength, love and selflessness. And that is The Cherry Picker's Daughter once again by Kerry Reed Gilbert that can be found under our Indigenous and Biography and Memoir genres. Mm. Sounds very powerful indeed. Yeah, absolutely. And that is the little spotlight on a couple of uh, new new additions, should I say, to the Australian Book Club's website. So if any of those titles has perked your interest or made your fingers itchy to turn a brand new page, by all means, please do visit the website, jump on. You can go straight to the latest editions if you'd like to jump straight to some of our brand new uh, listings. Or of course, you're welcome to have a look through the genres where you'll find a whole stack of awesome titles. So please do go have a look. Yes, most definitely. So, but Veronica, tell me about today's wonderful guest that you had the awesome opportunity to interview. So the interview that we're sharing today is with Kim Kelly. So Kim is a, a fiction writer. She's the author of 10 novels, and you'll find all of those on the Australian Book Lovers. And 
the one that we mostly are talking about today is a book called Her Last Words. And it's fascinating talking to Kim because she does a lot of historical fiction and she kind of switched genres a little bit, but it was just so delightful to talk to her about so many different things. And, you know, she has a fairly famous uh, Australian name, of course, but we talked about, you know, uh, changing genres, writing what you know, and about how important it is to write uh, from your heart and writing where you know. So for her, it was very much about um, connection to place. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. And something that I just wanted to mention, I think I spoke of this, that I was booked in to see, uh, to attend Acknowledge This, um, yes, which yes. was yeah uh, the training dad. So I went to Acknowledge This with Reese Paddock and Emma Gibbons, uh, both of them over in um, Perth, which is a traditional country of the Noongar people and there are a number of uh, tribes within uh, that nation, within that group. Uh, but it was just so fabulous to learn how to give an authentic acknowledgement of country. And it reminded me when I listened to Kim's interview again in, in preparation that connecting to your heart, connecting people and country, which is what the acknowledgement of country is all about. It's not just a tick box um, however respectful you might do it it's it's important to make sure that you know tell us a little bit about you that connects you to this country and then i tell you a little bit about me and so it creates those common values and that's kind of that thing that even we talked about in terms of writing a a pitch or putting the blurb on the back of your book you have to pick up the words and the themes that kind of connect you to what the writing is or what the message is. And, you know, that's something that we often ask our authors is what is the message in, in the book? And while many authors go, well, I didn't really write it with a, a message. It's, it's a fantasy or it's a thriller or it's a whatever. But it was interesting that Kim's readers said they would have known it was her writing regardless because of not the way she writes, but necessarily, but the message and the way she connects her people and the relationships and that kind of thing. So I thought that was really interesting to mm. think about what the messages are, because when I had written my first fantasy, Ochre Dragon, which is dragons, fantasy, magic, all those kind of things. But at its heart, when people got me to really nut down to what are the kernels of the, what's the message or what's the story, it's still about the work that I do all the time in my role as a coach in that it's exposing and bringing up the potential that people have to live a bigger life, whether that's a bigger out in the world or whether that's just a bigger within their own sphere of, of living. It's about uncovering that potential and giving them the confidence to know they can do whatever they want except I just added dragons and magic, you know, so, no. <laughs> you know, it, it's that kind of thing. And, and I know that, uh, you know, we've, we've talked a lot and, and thinking about your hallucinogenia project and about, you know, the existentialism and the meaning of life and, and life on the planet and how it's all connected is very much the same for you. So yeah, that's what Kim's interview really brought up for me is that writing what you know, as people would have heard that before, and I'm sure readers have, have heard that as well. But it's also where you know, and connecting the people and places is, is a really, really important part of it. Absolutely. And when it comes to themes, yeah, yeah, you're 100% yes. right. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it, but then saying, saying that, I don't know if it's always the case that you know the themes before you're going in. You may have an idea, no. but there may be new themes that emerge in the writing, and that's just the beautiful aspect of writing you may sit back and finish a draft and, and read through ready to go through its first edit stage or whatever you want to call it and there may be themes that have emerged that you didn't realize that you're consciously doing and uh, well and that readers tell you about and mm. this is the amazing thing is that you write the story but it's not until a reader um reads it from their point of view you know one two or 30 of them that you go ah oh, i didn't realize that was there but you know I love the concept of there being a deeper meaning in everything that we do that our conscious brain, which is busy talking about the superficial stuff and scrolling through Facebook and uh, not Facebook, Twitter for me, um, and all those kind of things. But it, there is still a recognition of the things, you know, the places, you know, the values that, you know, yes. And, and 
you know, deep down, I think even most people, so at least those people that enjoy a good book or good movie, uh, good music, at least a little part of each of us when we enjoy that sort of entertainment, you know, we're, we're looking for answers. And yeah. whether we're consciously aware of it or not, and if we're not looking for answers, we're looking for maybe uh, validity of the ex- of experiences that we've shared, mm-hmm. um, you know, or maybe validity of decisions that are made when it comes to, you know, morals in life or decisions taken in life. Was it the right thing to do? You know, good themes can lighten burdens for, for people, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can mm-hmm. expand horizons for people. Uh, yeah, themes are so important. And, yeah, like you said, ultimate, ultimately there is a deeper meaning in you know art in general isn't it and it's yeah. ultimately for me it all comes down to eventually that that mother theme of who are we and why are we here essentially uh, and and i think that's the the sort of the base of that that wonderful tree of of themes or the thematic branches that that come out uh, mm-hmm. but yes but look what a fantastic and inspiring sort of rabbit hole of thoughts go down. And, and that's yes. thanks to the wonderful interview with Kim Kelly. With so, Kim Kelly, who I think I said 10 books, but she's actually got 11. So, oh, well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'll just give her a little bit of an intro before we dive into her chat. So Kim is the author of 11 novels, including the acclaimed Wild Chicory and the Blue Mile. And she does talk about uh, the Blue Mile a little bit during our chat. She's best known for her historical fictions with distinctive warmth and lyrical charm. Kim leads her readers into the heart of some of Australia's naughtiest political and social contradictions. But each of her words shines with love, hope and occasionally a little magic. So for her sins, Kim is also a well-known book editor and reviewer because too much narrative action is never enough. She's originally from Sydney and today she lives on a small rural property in central New South Wales. So there you go. And you'll find uh, many of her books. uh, You'll be able to just look at australianbooklovers.com forward slash Kim Kelly and you can see connections to all of Kim's books there. Yes, and I think 11 is just a temporary current number i'm sure there's yes. plenty to come she's, something tells me there's a whole lot more about, yeah she does talk about some of her upcoming books too so there you go all right wonderful drum roll and um, ladies and gentlemen why we, may we please introduce the fantastic wonderful and exhilarating kim kelly So welcome everybody to the next author interview and I am absolutely delighted to have with me Kim Kelly. Now Kim is the author of Her Last Words which is a murder, a missing manuscript and undying love. So that's a great intro to a book for Australian book clubs. Welcome Kim. Thank you so much for having me, Veronica. It's wonderful to be here and it's wonderful to see all of the fantastic things that Australian Book Lovers has been doing. Well Ah, done. Thank you. Thank you. So, Kim, I'm coming to you today from uh, Wurundjeri country down here in Victoria. Where are you writing from? I am writing from Wurundjeri country um, in central New South Wales. I've been here for about six years. Uh, it's a wonderfully inspiring part of Australia and very diverse um, from the foot of the Blue Mountains out west to the edge of the desert. And mm, um, it's uh, yeah, a wonderful place to live. But I grew up on Gamakal country, which is uh, for Sydney side, it's, it's that area of La Perouse, the La Perouse Peninsula around Botany Bay. Ooh, and nice. um, that was hugely influential for me. Um, growing up, a wonderful place to grow up where the Aboriginal culture is incredibly strong and you can meet people there whose families have lived there forever. Mm, beautiful melting pot. Lots of influences for a writer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the, you know, wonderful privileges, and I mean that in every sense of the word, of growing up in that area of Sydney, is that you get an understanding that there are different ways of living, different ways of being. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not only is the um, Indigenous culture very strong and diverse in itself in the La Perouse area, but when I was growing up in the 70s, there were lots of kids at my primary school who came from different areas of Europe and Asia mm-hmm. and also families, particularly Chinese families, who'd been living in that area of Sydney for generations. And the influence that that has on you as a young person um, is wonderful in itself. But as a writer, um, being able to understand um, 
that there are those different ways of thinking, different languages, mm-hmm. different um, playfulness with language, different types of slang, mm. um, all sorts of different cultural influences, of course, feeds your imagination and empathy and understanding and helps you, you know, with your own um, linguistic playfulness and certainly in, in um, making an effort to make your characters rich and real as possible. Oh, I love that. Linguistic playfulness. Excellent. Yes. That's what they need to do to jump off the page. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. I think having that um, having that kind of an upbringing, having those influences as a young child has always made me um, curious. And in a funny way, I'm not a particularly confident person, but um, it's made me confident with language because I know everybody has their own voice mm-hmm. and I know that quite deeply. Mm, mm, fantastic. So with all those influences, Kim, when did you first admit that you were a writer? Oh, never, really, <laughs> um, is the answer. I, I mean, I, 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 obviously, professionally, I do, and I, and I have a long professional um, CV that says I'm a writer, but mm. it's been interesting. Even lately, I've been doing some academic work and, you know, calling up that CV and calling myself a writer is always a slightly uncomfortable thing Mm -hmm. to do. (laughs) And I think it's because all of us, particularly working in fiction or narrative nonfiction, we know that we will never be masters of what we do. There is no point in being a perfectionist if you're a writer. (laughs) Being, Being a writer of stories is about curiosity. It's about constant learning. It's about constantly knowing what you don't know. And I think that term writer or author, it uh, can make us uh, think that we um, are masters of what we do and none of us Uh, are. No, no, indeed. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the books that you write. So, um, and let's, you know, focus very much because this, you have 11 novels out in the world, but we do, (laughs) which is brilliant. That's scary. Makes me old too. Yeah, well, be, be, be careful about the old there. I think my head's wider than yours, so that's okay. <laughs> so, Kim, tell us about her last words. I was fascinated by the connection to um, uh, to writing and to the publishing industry. That always, you know, makes you think, oh, is there some truth in those words? Well, it's a funny old thing, her last words. I'm, I'm much more known as a writer of historical fiction. I, mm. I think probably one maybe that your listeners might know is um, the Blue Mile. It was set during the Great Depression and the building of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. It's, you know, quite um, an, an iconic um, time in Australian history and what have mm-hmm. you. And I do love to scrabble underneath those Australian icons mm-hmm. usually. Mm-hmm. But with her last words, it was my very first foray into contemporary fiction. Mm-hmm. And it started um, really, I was wanting to have a bit of a binge on the novella. I've written a couple of historical novellas and I really quite like the form. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, I, I want some inspiration. So I started reading a, a novel called The Red Notebook, a French novel translated into English. And I'm sorry, I've just forgotten. I've, cardinal sin, I've just forgotten the author's <laughs> oh, name. Oh, terrible. But That's I, all right. I, I know. And, and my library is, is, is about 50 metres away. So I can't. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> but it, it, be, it, be, it begins with a young woman who is coming home um, and she you know literally has the key in the door and she gets mugged and um knocked over the head and for me that was this massive trigger because her last words is based well very much inspired by a real story something that happened to an old university friend of mine um some years after we'd um graduated from university she was you know, having a night out, you know, a bit of a party girl as she was, and she was mm-hmm. walking down a dark street in Newtown and she uh, was mugged and left for dead and she oh. died as oh. a result. Uh, she was one of those one-of-a-kind people with an amazing laugh and an mm-hmm. amazingly spirited person who stayed in my consciousness all these years and the injustice oh. of it has always bit into me. Um, but she was also... Uh, a young journalist at the time and she had just completed her first manuscript right but 
I had asked her about it and she was a bit vague and, you know, cage and what have you, as, as we all are, but <laughs> yes. that stuck in my craw. Mm. That stuck in my craw as well. It was like oh, I always wanted to know what happened to her manuscript. Mm. And so, of course, reading this opening scene of um, uh, the Red Notebook, it just, bang, this story just poured out of me as though it had been waiting there for, you know, sort of almost 20 years, which it had. Ah. And um, I... Uh, I just went with it. I had no sense at all that this was going to be in any way publishable. I thought I was talking to myself. And as a result of that, um, because the the novel centres around a missing manuscript very much and what happens to that missing manuscript after um, the young woman, Fisby, her name is in the novel, is murdered, um, of course, having had such a background in publishing as well, of course, that tumbled into my experiences as an editor. I've been a book editor for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And the way that um, we deal with and um, commercialise and commodify um, manuscripts of our own in Australia at the moment. So all of those things tumbled together and the manuscript just roared out of me wow. at, a, at a mad pace. And, uh, yes, I was quite surprised um, that it was actually a novel because, you know, as I said at the beginning of this, I, I'm, um, I'm not known for my, uh, you know, explorations into the contemporary. So <laughs> right. it was a, a shock to me. Oh, and it a, had to a, be told. A, a shock. Absolutely. And I yeah. think stories really operate like that. I know yeah. I know a lot of writers feel that way that, you know, we have those pool of stories um, in our hearts. I think um, Julian Barnes called it his field to plough, these, you know, mm. sort of bunch of ideas and sometimes a geographical place that, as it is for him mm -hmm. that um, you go back to again and again. So although her last words is different in setting from my historical novels it still brings up so many of the same um themes that I've drawn on in the past which mm. is often you know our you know ridiculous petty bigotries in, a, yes. in Australia and our yeah. small mindedness that sort of you know contrasted with this wonderful generosity and bright sunshine of the country in which we live so that's all still there yeah. And I know that readers have said that it's so recognisably me, even though it's a change of scene. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but yes. that's my field I'm ploughing anyway. <laughs> Very good. So given that there are, you know, themes that I guess are your life that come through in, in your books as well, are there any secrets in your writing? Oh, that I love that question. That is <laughs> that is the, the best question ever. Oh, I, I, I well, so for me it is because I'm quite shy about you know sort of wearing my research or my um my in, my literary influences on my sleeve, mm. and I tend to mm. bury them deep in the story. And mm. you know there'll be allusions to Shakespeare or there'll be allusions to classical Greek mythology, which is a favourite one of mine. And in this big. Um, with Thisbe in her last words, I was able to actually put a couple of sentences in there that were a flag. Yes, this is an exploration of the myth of um, Thisbe and Pyramus. You know, ah. I was, just, <laughs> was a actually able to, you know, have the courage to to, to put that in there. So my um, stories are often threaded. It's more like a, a personal trail of breadcrumbs, and yeah. um, I'm very conscious of not being heavy-handed about things like that because mm -hmm. you don't want to interfere with that sort of you know the narrative flow and the reader's entertainment of what what they're reading and you, you mm. don't want to sound like a wanker either, <laughs> <laughs> or too much of a nerd <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly mm. which I am but um you know I, I think um the the most wonderful secrets that emerge um from my stories are the way that somehow family history bubbles up to the surface there's always a deep personal connection that I either wasn't um, aware of, or maybe it's something I heard in childhood, maybe it's something that I've forgotten over time, that as a result of writing the story, I go, oh, that's spooky. I feel ah. like my ancestors are talking to me. Ah. And the one that happened, <laughs> the one that happened with her last words was that a lot of the action takes place in Bondi. A lot of the, 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 the scenes take place there. Mm -hmm. And there's a street in which um, the characters, uh, the, one of the main characters lives. It's the street on which the young woman, Thisbe, is murdered. And 
I realised where I'd set it, like I always draw little maps and things like that of streets. Mm -hmm. I realised after I'd written it that I had set it, I had set their house just one street back from where my great-grandmother had lived. Ah. And my great-grandmother was very much the inspiration for a grandmother who exists in her last words in the imagination. And ah. it's a it's a little bit hard to describe <laughs> without boring your listeners, um, you know, sort of like telling them some weird dream that I had um, <laughs> last night or, or what have you. But it's those little things that bubble up. And I think it sort of speaks very much to that idea again that, you know, as storytellers, we do have that, I call it soul soup. It's, mm, it's, it's a bit beautiful. of a, a, a pool of, you know, sort of dreamlike memories, recollections, um, desires and what have you that inform our themes and our characters in ways we don't really understand. Mm, mm. And it, it's tapping into all that creative soup. I love that soul soup. That is a great one. Mm. Okay. So tell me then, given all of these influences and the, the things that are downloading uh, are from your soup or um, scooping up from your soup, <laughs> whatever we like to say them. So are you... Some a, of it tastes horrible. Oh, enough, so. Yeah, some of it needs to, you know, be discarded, I think, strained through the soup. Yes. <laughs> um, Kim, are you a plotter or a pantser or somewhere in between? I'm kind of somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Um and again, I think this is really, you know, probably where most writers sit, that, you know, you have an idea of what you want to do. Um, you start off with, with that idea, but you don't necessarily know where it's going to take you. Mm -hmm. I quite often, be, particularly with my historical fictions, mm -hmm. of course, I have to stick to um, those historical facts. Oh, I know not yeah. all. I know not all historical fiction is do that, but I do. I'm a bit of a stickler mm -hmm. for for the facts and so I, I know that my my work is going to be um, somehow confined by those parameters mm -hmm. and so I know that you know for example in the book I mentioned the Blue Mile mm -hmm. I know that um, the the actual building of the Sydney Harbour Bridge was a you know a series of plot points in itself right, and I yeah. knew that at its completion I wanted certain things to happen for the characters but I didn't know how they were going to get there. Uh, and for me, yeah. that's where that kind of interplay between um, imagination and research really has fun with me mm -hmm. because there are things that I discover along the way that hopefully the reader will be, you know, somehow excited to discover mm -hmm. as well um, that are, you know, sort of points of curiosity, of interest, of, you know, sort of some colourful element that, I didn't realize about that period and so mm -hmm. I'll be able to to I, I have the flexibility of not being a plotter gives you that flexibility to be able to then to respond to research as it comes yeah. to you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I love that beautiful and it sounds like there's a lot of research involved I mean obviously for your historical uh, fiction as well but tell us a little bit about how deep you go on your research then Oh, absolutely. Um, research for me, I think, um, I think I've said to you before that um, I sometimes think that I write novels as an excuse um, <laughs> to, <laughs> to do research. Yeah. I, I once spent three hours in a country museum in Golgong, the Pioneers Museum, if anyone's, you know, sort of ever interested in going into central New South Wales near Mudgee. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Good advertisement for them. Let them know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, oh, you know, for wonderful. locals, that's great, you know, it's, supporting the local it's a, well, it's, uh, industry. It's, it's a yeah. bit distant. It's, it's, it's about two hours away from, from okay. where I live. Okay. <laughs> I, once, I once spent three hours in there speaking to a very enthusiastic um a person in the museum um, about early Australian washing machines, and what? I knew then that I had a problem. I knew then that I had a problem with research. Um, so far, I haven't found a support group for my problem, but. <laughs> I've been able to write uh, a few novels as uh, a result. Oh, very good. Very good. But curiosity sounds like it's uh, very much one of your strengths. Absolutely. It's a lifelong thing. And I, yeah. I often tell that, obviously, I, I do um, a bit of mentoring and definitely um, I'm, a, I'm an editor as well. And um, it, it's a common thing that comes up 
um, particularly with um, authors who are just starting out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a good thing not to know where you're going. Mm. It's a good thing not to know um, because it gives you, you know, again, that word flexibility. It gives you the flexibility to go into places that you haven't gone before, find characters, find story that you haven't thought of. Mm. That's what's going to create exciting storytelling, I think. Yes. Yeah, look, absolutely. And as you say, it, it's hard. It's the same. Uh, I'm also a, a coach as part of my work and young managers coming up want to tell you everything that they've done. You, <laughs> you don't have to tell me everything. I trust that you'll it'll do become those things apparent. and it'll become apparent <laughs> if you haven't. So that's okay. Leave me some mystery. That's exactly, that's exactly it, isn't it? It's, um, yeah. I, I, you know, a, a lot of people are really, you know, sort of, um, I, when you're just starting out, you, you don't really understand how to use all your research. Mm. You don't need to use it all at once. It's a common problem too, isn't it? That, mm. you know, mm. it's okay to drip feed. It's okay to yes. allow that that cleverness you have and yeah. those <laughs> insights you have to become apparent through the story. You don't have to tell us all at once. Yes, absolutely. So uh, tell me, talking about young readers, who helped you most when you were starting out as a writer? Oh, I love this question too. I mean, obviously, <laughs> there are so obviously, you know, your readers, your agent, um, the people who, um, you know, sort of help you with the nuts and bolts of publishing, however mm -hmm. that publishing goes, these people are all integral. But I think it's the people who feed your confidence in rich and real ways that um, are a really sort of formative influence. And certainly mm -hmm. for me, um, the very first editor who looked at my work, who was a friend, but also a bit of a hard-nosed editor, mm -hmm. who uh, looked at my very first manuscript that I'd completed way back in 2004, and she said, yep, Kimmy, you've got a novel there. Ooh. Um, I've never... You know, like there was lots of things wrong with that novel, yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, it was my first attempt. It wasn't perfect. But yeah. that first person, it's, it's like having your first child or your first <laughs> love or whatever. That first person who says, yes, you've done this mm. and it's a goer. Mm. That I've never forgotten it and she'll mm. always have a very cherished place in my heart oh, but there's fantastic. also one university friend who mm. um has read every book that I've ever written he's understood where I'm coming from as a writer since we were very young and he's a writer himself mm -hmm. and knowing that is always like kind of an emotional backstop that I know that there's somebody who's in a literary sense got my back someone mm -hmm. I can talk to and share ideas with and someone I know who'll buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll sell at least one copy. <laughs> one copy, yeah. Oh, very good, very good. So tell me Australia if, uh, features prominently in, in your stories. Yes. Why the choice of, of that? as opposed to historical fiction is often uh, looking at the European experience or, you know, an American experience. So for you, it certainly exploring this continent has been. Absolutely. Boring. And, yeah. and even, even um, finer than that, I, I have written one um, highly imagined story in Jewel Sea, which is a story that's set off the coast of, Western Australia it's a mm -hmm. it's a shipwreck story and that was a story that captured my heart and certainly all of my interests about Australia but it's almost a fantastical story so that was, it's a little bit different to what I usually write mm -hmm. and I am usually quite close in on Sydney and mm -hmm. certain areas of New South Wales where I've been and the reason for that is um, my stories are very much countries of the heart in themselves mm -hmm. they come from real places within me mm -hmm. um, and points of of curiosity or experiences whether that be you know great turmoil uh, grief heartbreak mm -hmm. I'm often as so many writers do I'm not necessarily conscious of it but I am certainly doing it um, I'm workshopping my own emotions Yes. I'm workshopping my own traumas and questions about life through what I write. And so the logical place, of course, for those things 
to take place are in the literal countries mm -hmm. where they occurred. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a perfect match. Um, you know, I'm obviously, you know, don't I don't have a time machine. I can't go back to 1930s Sydney or 1860s um, Bathurst or, you know, <laughs> where, wherever I've, I've said a story. I, I can't yeah. go back there, but there is something about those places. It's not even necessarily mine. Um, I set a, a small um, novella, one of my novellas, Sunshine, is set in North Burke. Mm -hmm. And it came out of a love for my husband who was born there. Mm. And it's so it's kind of a heart country in that I feel close to that part of New South Wales because he's close to that part of New yeah. South Wales. And that feeds my curiosity. So that's kind of the way it's like, a you know, an emotional network. Mm -hmm. um, all of my stories are, are linked emotionally in some way. And sometimes it's straight out family stories as well. So, yeah. you know, going back to that, that story about the Harbour Bridge, the Blue Mile, the, the way that that story um, begins in that area of Chippendale in those streets, mm -hmm. that's my grandfather, my Irish grandfather's place that's mm -hmm. his country in Australia and so I had all of those you know um, family history and deep emotional connections to that place and that's where the story springs from and the characters too mm. so mm. but yes the, the the thing that I'm about to embark on the, the next story I'm about to embark on which is also a family story mm -hmm. it's um my ancestral grandfather's uh experiences and you know wild life story of um, being an actor in the East End of London. That's wow. terrifying. That's <laughs> terrifying to me because I, although I do kind of, you know, through my own father, the East End of London and what have you has always been a part of, and that Jewishness too in the family line has always been a part of my own consciousness and identity and storytelling soup um, mm -hmm. and what have you. But it's so far away. I'm so, I feel so <laughs> disconnected from it. it it's yeah. intimidating for me. Mm. So in answer to your question of why I don't write the, you know, sort of, you know, I call them off planet stories, why yeah. I don't write a story in 16th century, you know, Italy or, or what have you is because there's no reason for me to go there. There's no yeah. sort of deep emotional reason for me to go there. Although I love reading other people's stories about it. It's, it's not what's going to, um, captivate me and keep me going over the length of a novel because as you know um, it takes a long time to write a novel it and does. You've, got, <laughs> you've got to want to be in that place you've yeah. got to want to know and be inspired and excited about that place yourself yes and those exciting places for me are as I've just blabbed for ages about. Uh, <laughs> that's all right you know, I can hear the passion that's fantastic no that it that is really beautiful so uh, tell me then, you, you mentioned, you know, reading other people's stories. Whose stories do you like to read? Oh, I'm such a bowerbird. Um, and I think that comes from the influence that being an editor has had on me. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly not having a conventional, you know, a lot of writers have, you know, sort of cut their teeth on all the classic children's books and what have you. I mm -hmm. didn't. I, <laughs> my, okay. my grandfather... My grandfather's set of encyclopedias was my go-to place ah, when I was a kid. <laughs> and, you know, sort of non-fiction was my thing. So I, I do get a lot of fun out of non-fiction, which feeds mm -hmm. my research. But in terms of fiction, I came to understand um, post-university, actually, because I think university, um, particularly in a traditional degree in literature, can kind of funnel you along certain lines of thinking, whereas... Mm. Um, going into book editing in a highly commercial publishing house opened my eyes to, again, you know, different voices, different ways of thinking and being. I, my bread and butter work, particularly as a freelancer after, after I'd worked in-house, was fantasy novels that I had mm. never, I had never read them as a kid. Oh. So of course I, br I brought a certain excitement to each one I edited. Go, <laughs> oh, I've never been here before. This is great. Um, and so my reading, although I don't, I don't read fantasy um, for. Uh, I it, it's hard to say that I ever read for pleasure either, because I think once you've immersed yourself in the writing world for so long, it's very difficult not to read a book. Um, 
for its parts. It's very yes. difficult not to see its structure, yes. not to see the way it's made. That's a different. That that doesn't mean the experience isn't joyful. It just means it's a bit different. Yes. Um. Yeah. And I the the last book I. I, I read a, I read a bit, um, so I think my answers have changed since the answers I gave <laughs> yes. you, um, before this interview. But one book that I found really interesting is Tara June Winch's um, The Yield. Ah, yes, um, and for anybody who wants to look um, at a book whose structure is interesting and different, there are lots of things to think about the way that. Tara Jean Winch has put that story together mm, and the richness mm. that are different. It's not tricksy at all. Not no, at all. No, it's, it's there are very good story. reasons why there are three different strands. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting to think about um, the effect of, of those particular strands. That's a book that I'm still thinking about. And mm. um, partly as a result and partly as some study that I'm doing, it's brought me to reread The Secret River. Ah, right. And um, to think about what to think about who your storyteller is, who your narrator is, and why, what they have to say, and how they're saying it. It's been an interesting journey. I won't, I won't make any controversial comments about it here, but, <laughs> but yes, I can, I can highly recommend that everyone who's interested in um, Australian stories and the way that we structure them to go and read *The Yield*. Yeah, I second that recommendation absolutely. So what other words of advice would you give aspiring authors? Oh, there's so much. And um, I, my, my head goes nuts when I, um, <laughs> when I, when I think of that, uh, when I think of that question. And I think I'll just um, read out uh, what I wrote in the, mm -hmm. in the Q and a actually, I'll yeah. just find it. I'm <laughs> um, just to keep myself under control um <laughs> so yeah the first thing i would say is skill up um mm. you'll never spend too much time trying to understand what a story is how it works and how you might go about writing yours and you'll never stop learning either um and building your knowledge of the nuts and bolts of language voice narrative mm. approach characterization the mechanical structure of a story that will feed your creativity in ways that you haven't imagined yet. Don't be intimidated by any of it either. Go at your own pace and invest in your work as much as you can, um, even if even if that's only you know ten minutes a day of writing or reading or thinking about what you do. Mm -hmm. Always respect your work as well speak your truths mean what you say don't write just because you like the idea of becoming a writer write because you want to follow those lines of inquiry or lines of imagination that turn you on because then you're going to turn other people on aren't mm. you so mm. um and and dare to want to change the world um ah, you know, even great. even yeah. your, even your <laughs> tiny your tiny little 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 bit of it um every word counts somewhere somehow writing stories often seems like a hopelessly indulgent solitary thing to do but the world <laughs> will always need more stories yes. and the world needs yours even if it's not that great the world still needs yours and by writing that first one you might like me become hopelessly addicted and have to write you know 10 or 12 10 or 12 more. <laughs> that is great advice really great advice kim fantastic all right. So I'd love to keep chatting, but we both need to get back to writing more stories. <laughs> back to work. <laughs> back to work. So tell me, where can people find you uh, online? Where are your connections and social media? I am on Facebook, Kim Kelly Author. I mm -hmm. am on um, Twitter as well, Kim Kelly Author and Instagram. You'll find my uh, little blog space too at kimkellyauthor.com. Mm -hmm. um, and that's about me. You can find my books at all the, the usual online places in um, paperback, ebook, and audiobook. Fantastic. All right. Now, Kim, you have uh, said that you would be very happy to read us a little bit from your story. So uh, any final words? And then we're going to uh, jump into some fantastic words. Um, the only thing that I would say, and it's um, probably a bit more industry, you know, specific, that I think it's wonderful, you know, particularly, you know, with the work that you're doing with Australian book lovers, it's wonderful that 
we as you know authors are supporting each other and talking mm. about each other's work i think mm. that's fantastic but i think the next step in trying to keep australian literature as vibrant and diverse as possible is to think of ways that we as authors can grow readers yes. and to invite readers into our world not in a self-promotional way i mean you know if you live in an area where you know it's you know, maybe it's, you know, there, there aren't a hell of a lot of intellectuals reading at your local coffee shop. Mm -hmm. You can go to your local library, for example, and, you know, ask the local librarian if you can put on a talk mm. that invites readers in, not just to your work, but into the library to discover books and how nourishing they are. Because when you think about it, long form storytelling is one of the safest forms of psychological therapy that you can have it's a cheap form of friendship as mm. well you get to meet strangers that you never would meet otherwise mm. long form storytelling is very good for us in in very many ways and i could bang on <laughs> the conversation about we might need that. to get you back on this <laughs> <laughs> i think that we need to go there particularly in australia we need to um, make people see that reading is not eating your greens. Reading mm. is eating chocolate mm. for your soul. Oh, I like so that. So there you go. Yes. Now that, that is absolutely fantastic. And I couldn't agree more. Um, in the uh, last episode of the podcast that we recorded, we had some feedback and quotes from some of the publishers and, and industry experts saying that they've seen readers increasing and lapsed readers seem to be coming back you know given yes. that we were all locked down and those kind of things i'm going yes yes, yes. bring them on back it's let, a, let it's us entertain a, you let us educate you you know let us absolutely you know trigger emotions you know let us you know get it's to amazing where something. we go mm. um and talking mm. to um librarians over the last sort of 18 months about a year ago when the drought was really bad out here mm -hmm. and the way that um farmers and people involved in, you know, reliant on, on farming activity mm -hmm. suddenly had nothing to do. And that's where, that's where depression can, mm -hmm. can really become very dangerous for people who are used to being mm -hmm. intensely busy and suddenly the rug is pulled out from under them and life is very hard. Where can you go where your brain can have a holiday when physically you cannot? A yes. book. Yeah. And, and libraries out in the Central West found the same thing, particularly with audio books. If, if you're not particularly, you know, or if you go on, uh, you know, sort of if, if you have to go on long commutes and what have you, mm -hmm. and you don't have a lot of time to read, try an audio book. Mm -hmm. the same Fantastic. Thing. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. I think we will get you back to have a little bit more of a discussion, there, but let's hold that in the future. I'm I making did, I notes. Did tell you I, can, I did tell you I can talk under wet cement. It's one of the things I'm not shy about. Uh, excellent. Excellent. All right. So what I need now is your reading voice, because I know you have uh, some fabulous audio books already out there, but we are very lucky here at um, Australian Book Lovers. And Kim is going to narrate the opening chapter of her last words, which, you know, as she explained, well, came out in a big rush. I must confess, I do not read my audio books and you'll probably discover why in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Look, so apologies, that... apologies in advance for any stumbles. I'm not much of an actor, but we'll no. see how we go. So this is the very opening of her last words. Thisbe has, has come home and she's... Um, wanting her boyfriend John to read her very first manuscript and he's a bit reluctant so I'm sure that many listeners will understand how enraging that can be for an author. So they kept their voices low even as their tempers rose. It was a hot night, last blast of summer hot, the cool change running late like a train held up between stations leaving them nowhere to go but irritation. Thisby gripped the back of the kitchen chair nearest, her small, slim fist white knuckled as she hissed, I don't think I can trust a man who doesn't read. A man who doesn't read, John snorted, sloshing the rest of the red into their glasses, apportioning slightly more into his own, she noted. I never said I wouldn't read it, Thiz. You know that. It's just that I don't have time right now. Don't have time. Thisby mocked him, mimicking the flare of his nostrils, his arrogance, slouching, easy and amused. Even the way his bleach-streaked hair fell across his forehead seemed insulting, lazy, up itself. 
you're no one special, John Jacobson. Thisby thought these words fiercely, but wasn't quite drunk enough to say them. And yet, only halfway through her second glass, she was already drunk, overtired and undernourished, having eaten nothing since about half past three that afternoon, stuffing a box of sushi down on her way to work. Work, her job as door bitch at the garden, Sydney's latest after dark playground for the rich and soulless wasn't real work. She was paid to judge who was admitted and who was rejected based on what they were wearing, how good looking they were and whether or not they were famous, at the same time maintaining a roughly 70-30 chick bloke split and resisting the temptation to press her stamp too firmly into their Botox foreheads instead of their wrists. It was not a great use of her first class honours in literature, but well, she had to pay the rent, didn't she? While John stood there with that smug smile of his, speck of parsley on a front tooth, and he made even that look like it should be a new trend. Fizz, come on, he held out her glass. Be nice. Nice? Her annoyance bolted into anger. I've never been nice in my life and I don't intend it to start now. What? John was shocked. She could see he was struggling to keep his own emotions controlled. She could hear the snarl beneath his words. You'd think I'd just refuse to, I don't know, give up my other lover or something. I'll read your novel when I can concentrate properly on it. When the shoot has wrapped up for the season, is that too much to ask? Thisby's mind spun through all that seemed too much. She was jealous, so maddeningly jealous, that John had got his first big part in a TV series. He'd leapt from shampoo and pizza commercials to Constable Gary Dawson in the popular justice drama, Hard Evidence. And although it was a fairly terrible show, it was a start, a more than decent start, that had seen his bare torso already gracing the pages of at least two high circulation women's magazines. That Thisby didn't really watch TV and never read women's magazines was beside the point. He was on his way and she was nowhere. They'd been travelling the same road for so long, six years. They'd met at university at an audition for the Drama Society's production of No Room for Dreamers, a play about an eccentric idealist who believed good sex was the answer to the world's problems, but who self-immolates at the end. John got the lead. Thisby had balked at the last minute, too shy to perform at all. He was a couple of years older, and he was so beautiful she could hardly believe he wanted to talk to her at the bar afterwards. She confessed to him there and then that she wasn't an actor but a writer looking to be inspired, and his smile had filled her universe. Still, a bundle of nerves and insecurities meant she balked at every advance he made from then on, until a little over a year ago, when she finally struck on the thing she wanted to write, struck on a vein of certainty and confidence, and she'd held on tight. Now that she'd actually written it, how could he not want to read it immediately? How could he not be celebrating her achievement this second? How could she have raced off to the office shop on her way to work to have it printed out for him and him alone, only to have him say, hey, that's great, Ziz, as if she'd just told him she'd scored a new pair of shoes on discount. I'm dying for you to read it, she'd bounced up and down in front of him to show how shining she was with excitement. And he'd said, oh, yeah, sure, of course, when I get the chance. How could this be happening? They'd been talking about moving in together after all these years of being so careful with her heart and piece by piece giving it over to him. In so many essential ways, the manuscript in her backpack was him. And now a coldness swept through her, black as the sea beyond the surf, as she told him, it would take you a couple of hours to read it. It's not very long. You don't have a couple of hours for me. You know that's not true, John said but where there should have been all kindness and sympathy, all Thisby heard was impatience. He took another gulp of wine. Thiz, come on. Somewhere inside her tumbling tangle, she knew she was overreacting. She knew she would calm down in an hour or so and resolve this, like the 25-year-old grown-up she was. Their fights were never anything more than spats, churlish little bursts, mostly from herself, that were quickly sorted with apologies on both sides and the best sex imaginable. But not tonight. Tonight her disappointment raged like a monster unleashed from an ancient cave, primal, wounded. She picked up her backpack, felt its weight as she slung it over her shoulder, heavy with unloved manuscript, though it was only 187 pages in length, tiny. 
She was as tiny as her resentment was huge, overwhelming. She walked down the hallway towards the front door. And things go very wrong for Thisbe after that. I think I'll leave it there. Sounds wonderful. Now, I have to admit that uh, your book came across the desk when we had our launch giveaway. So thank you very much for, for donating that. And when I read the, the blurb on the back, I thought, oh, what if I give it to nobody? But no, sadly, somebody won it and I had to give it away. So <laughs> it's now on my to-be-read list. So I, you might have to, uh, you might see a little, yeah, another sale going very shortly. I'm terrible. I just buy oh, way too nice. many books. <laughs> thank you so much. No, sounds fantastic and beautifully read. So thank you very much, Kim Kelly, for being being a guest on Australian Book Lovers. Thanks so much, Veronica. So what a brilliant chat with Kim and all about connection for me, really, that was if I had to bring one word out of that, uh, it would be, yeah, connection. Yeah. And, and hey, look, fantastic interview, but thank you so much, Kim, for a wonderful reading as well. Yeah. I think we Ooh, are getting so spoiled here at the Australian Book Lovers podcast. Oh, we are. We are. And not only that, but we've actually got an audio book interview from somebody other than me, which is fantastic. So Hayley Walsh has given us a couple of uh, audio book reviews, which is fantastic. So stay tuned for more Absolutely. fabulous things at the end. And if you would like to uh, share a book review, whether it's uh, one of the books on our website or another Australian author, uh, please feel free to record that and send it on into us and you might make your way onto the podcast. Yes, well, I'd, I'd almost guarantee to a certain degree that you make it on the podcast. <laughs> well, are you not sick of my voice yet, are you, Darren? No, 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 no. No. <laughs> no. Um, but for anyone out there who is, you know, toying with the idea or thinking, ah, oh, I couldn't do it, honestly, give it a try. You might might discover a whole new, you know, passion uh, because it can be fun. Uh, jump yes. on a microphone and look again. I can't say too much, but there may be options down the track too for to turn it into a little bit more than just a bit of fun. But to start with, yeah, give it a shot. You may discover that it's a whole lot of fun, and you know, next thing you know, you just can't wait to read a new book and and get a review down. And yes. we'll be at no problems putting it on too. So we'd love to have some voices, some Aussie voices out there, because uh, we know that you're passionate book lovers, and I'd love to put some passionate book loving interviews or should I say reviews on the podcast and you'll inspire a whole bunch of other people out there as well so yeah feel free to send something excellent now drum roll do, oh, do, do, do. have you got your quotes ready for I this I have episode? got my quotes ready Ooh. let me just go to the right page and what inspired your quotes today Veronica so my quotes were very much drawn from Kim's connection to heart and authentic and, and those kind of things and I'm I'm going to keep it to two i've got three but anyway i'll take um, go on I, have I, you got three no <laughs> no no but i think in this instance looking forward to in time a little bit like in the next yep. five minutes uh, <laughs> it's possibly only fair that you're allowed to have three okay <laughs> <laughs> all right well let me start with a nice short one this is from uh william wordsworth uh ah yes yes yeah well don't need to tell you about him so fill your paper with the breathings of your heart. He definitely that? has a way with words, doesn't he? It does, yes. Well, hence his surname, I suppose. <laughs> well, Every word is worthy. Yes, yes. Uh, for anybody who is not familiar, um, William's words, William, now see, that's a bit of a tongue, twi tongue twister as well. William Wordsworth, I wonder, did he get Will or Bill? Anyway, uh, was an English romantic poet who, mm -hmm. along with Samuel Taylor Coleridge, he kind of helped to launch the romantic age in English literature. So there you go. Yeah, and look, and I mean, one of the sort of things that gets thrown around in life when it comes to having to make decisions or, you know, navigating through the world we live in is yep. sometimes it's follow your heart. Yeah. Uh, and you know that's usually at the end of the day that's usually kind of the, the best advice you can go with because everything else after that will be okay yes because because uh, ultimately you know the the yearnings of the heart is, is what drives us and as long as you're following your heart well then you know whether you know there's fantastic uh great things or, or trials and tribulations at least you you've you've done the right thing by yourself and your place in the universe so yeah that that quote's beautiful you know that's put lovely. the breathings of the heart down yeah and know. yeah i feel like the breathings is kind of the ups and the downs and mm -hmm. the ins and the outs it's it's not a a static thing it's it's a something that's alive and if you put that 
on paper, then you are going to connect with somebody. Yeah, your readers will know that Oh, the words are great. Anyway, okay, what have you got for me? Okay, well, I've actually uh, been inspired a little bit by Kim's interview today uh, mm -hmm. when talking about a lost manuscript. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So I've got a couple of quotes about that. Well, manuscript. Mm -hmm. uh, so my first one is by Alvi Siaran. Um, now, the quote is, when you write a manuscript, it feels like being in a relationship with someone. You'll hate it, get bored with it, be pissed off like you just want to break up. But just like any relationship, you will fall in love again and again, like you don't want to lose it. So I thought that's, uh, that's yeah. That's nice, yes. Yeah, adds a little bit of uh, 360 dimensions to a manuscript as far as when it comes to emotional content and the ride that you're going to go along, or the ride that the manuscript's going to take you on, really. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it, it is such a personal thing and it's, why I always try to be as a reader so terribly careful about reviews that I do. Yeah, there's I might I did some research a little bit into uh, there's some interesting articles about the power of readers is changing the face of publishing. But anyway, we'll look at that next time. But I if I don't enjoy all of the story, I try to make sure that the feedback that I'm giving acknowledges the effort and the the work that I know you know most writers have put into gathering their story and building their world and developing their characters and you know putting it all together so mm. yeah it's it is a bit of a love hate and yeah well this it goes back to your <laughs> Wordsworth quote and that is you, you yes know, if you, you you put the breathings of the heart on paper and I mean that is dangerous because yeah. people will you know you, you're exposing yourself but mm. at the same time you're not really because if you let people's uh, criticism, which is often needed, like we need criticism every day, really in life, otherwise, you know, it becomes a little bit of a false sense of our own selves. But yep. um, if we let the criticism drive our artistic endeavors though, and mm -hmm. shape how, or, or, or we it forces us to put limits on those breathings of the heart on paper, then that's a problem because that's no longer the heart putting the breathing on the paper. It's, mm. it's only snippets. But whereas if you put your heart and soul on the paper and someone says, I don't like it, that's fine. I mean, yeah, it stings yeah. a little, but at the same time, yeah. you still go to bed at night going, you know what, but I put my heart and soul on that paper. And that's yeah. what gives that uh, nice rest in the heart and soul because you've been true to it. And you're right, it can be tricky. I always think of it like when I go see, I mean, reading's a different thing, but when it comes to, you know, for example, movies, you know, I'll sit in the cinema and having worked in the film industry and spent many a day slugging in mountains and cursing the fact that 12 hours is only a short day and it's already day, you know, hour 16 and you just want to go home and you realize how much effort everybody puts into a production. Yes. And, and yet I'm still the first one to go, you know what, that movie should, oh, what a joke. <laughs> and I'm, I'm aware that everybody that worked on that movie must have gone through hell, you know, um, not hell, but really put their blood, sweat and tears. But look, I'm sorry, Aquaman is still an absolute shocker. <laughs> And I don't know how they even made ten dollars. Well, I know they did. I got sucked into paying for a ticket, but but no. But being a critic, that's a whole different. But you know, they critique. Yeah, it's it's a weird thing, isn't it? But being yeah. uh, putting your work out there to be critiqued and yes, um, yeah. Look, it's important to take take advice sometimes, but otherwise, still settle for the heart first, and then go yeah. from there. Yeah. And Very don't good. and don't watch the sequel to Ackerman, please, people. <laughs> please. They had windshield underwater. That's not right. <laughs> oh dear all right let me give you another quote then to take your mind off aquaman yeah i'm getting angry Calm uh, down. right <laughs> well oh, see i had two to choose no i'm going to go with this one because you you might appreciate this so this one is from christopher walken uh who uh most people will know is a, an american actor oh fantastic uh, i was gonna say yeah. is it uh, we're talking about the actor yeah 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 he's so a comedian and, and singer and he's appeared in more than 100 films and television shows so he does have some you know quite often see little bits and pieces of his uh, droll words around but i thought this was this was kind of a uh, good none of us are getting out of here alive so please stop treating yourself like an afterthought Eat the delicious food, walk in the sunshine, jump in the ocean, say the truth that you're carrying in your heart like hidden treasure. Be silly, be kind, be weird. There's no time for anything else. Touche, yes. How about that? That kind yeah. of brings it all together, doesn't it? Yeah, it puts a smile on your face here, something like yeah. that. Yeah. 
uh, because something tells me I've never met the man, uh, but he definitely carries an air on film as someone who probably uh, is, yeah, probably carries himself just like that in real life and uh, probably brings a lot of joy to people around him. Yeah. But it's true, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes you just got to go for it, just switch off. And yeah, I mean, at what point does it become such a rare thing to have a giggle and a laugh? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I laugh a little bit, but yeah. do you know what I mean? In, in a world where it's easy to, to or I, speaking for myself, you start, you start to place so many, well, responsibilities are responsibilities, but um, expectations and they slowly layer upon layer that you build them and, and then they become such a heavy focus and a heavy weight. And at some point, you know, when you can just go, you know what, that's it. I'm going down the beach, putting my feet in the water and I'm going to think about dolphin. That's it. <laughs> And it's a beautiful thing to be able to do it. And yeah. if you're lucky enough to see dolphins out there, ha ha, then you, you walk back with absolute springy step and a yep. lightness to your soul, definitely. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay. So yes, give us your number two. Okay. So the, the reason why I was thinking maybe three is okay because my number two is a little bit of a long one. All right. Now it is based, um, again, on, on, on manuscripts, but a little mm -hmm. bit from the discussion with Kim. Mm hmm and this is, uh, well, a quote, yeah, kind of, it's a long quote from a Jack, Jacques, should I say, Jacques Guy. And now it's about the Voynich manuscript. Have you heard about that? No. Oh, it's fascinating. So, but I'll read the quote first. The Voynich manuscript, which has been dubbed the most mysterious manuscript in the world, is named after its discoverer, the American antique book dealer and collector, Wilfred M. Voynich, who discovered it in 1912 amongst a collection of ancient manuscripts kept in Villa Mondragoni in Frascati near Rome. Wilfred Voynich judged it to date from the late 13th century on the evidence of the calligraphy, the drawings, the vellum and the pigments. It is some 200 pages long, written in an unknown script of which there is no known other instance in the world. It is oh. abundantly illustrated with awkward colored drawings, drawings of unidentified plants, of what seems to be herbal recipes, of tiny naked women frolicking in bathtubs connected by intricate plumbing looking more like anatomical parts than hydraulic contraptions, mm -hmm. of mysterious charts in which some have seen astronomical objects seen through a telescope, some live cells seen through a microscope, of charts into which you may see a strange calendar of zodiacal signs populated by tiny naked people in rubbish bins. <laughs> and that was by Jacques Guy. And that's a pretty good little quote wow. and a slash description on the Voynich manuscript, which has been something that's fascinated me for years. And essentially yeah. it is a, a book which you can now go online and Voynich is V O Y N for November I C H the Voynich mm -hmm. manuscript. You can actually uh, download, I think as a PDF or at least view the pages, it'll obviously digital images. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, it is a book. Nobody knows who wrote it. Nobody knows the language. The best code breakers in the world cannot decipher it. The images in it, on one hand, they look terrestrial from Earth, and then suddenly they don't. There are plants that have never been identified. Very, very strange book. Some people said it may be a hoax, like one of the most elaborate hoax, hoaxes ever. Yeah. Um, however, there is still no agreement upon it. It's just this very odd book that uh you know the, the the child of me thinks if if some if an alien had come and gone oh no i started heading back to wherever they went i left a book down in the park this is what they'd find oh yeah it's very very strange so yes <laughs> <laughs> and it's good to keep a little bit of mystery of the world I, yeah. after just talking from christopher there saying you know enjoy and, and take a moment to uh but mystery has to be a good part of the world as well and uh yeah. there you go listeners i will definitely put a link in the show notes but if you haven't heard of the Voynich manuscript and uh, are getting a bit bored at some point over a coffee or tea, jump online, have a look, and maybe maybe you'll take it upon yourself to possibly become the first person in the world to understand what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And that's my second quote, which I'm sure you'll agree with, because it's probably worthy of three. So. <laughs> it's definitely worthy of three. Good Lord. I'll keep it short next week, next uh, time. No, 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 that, that, that's okay. Hey, we're here to have a good time. Absolutely. Uh, and do, uh, yeah talk all things reading and writing and that is indeed one just remember though uh given Number that three. it's oh, yes. the end oh, i won't do my third quote i'm going to save that for another time because oh really yeah are you want it yeah i think so i'd love all it all right okay this is one then by uh brene brown so she's a, an american researcher whose work i started to get um in touch with oh, a few years ago and i've even given her a hug in the toilets at one of the hotels in the city when I went and heard her speak, which is just 
She was just lovely. She was really, really gorgeous. Uh, anyway, authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be real, the choice to be honest, and the choice to let our true selves be seen. That's a beautiful quote. How about that? Yeah. And, and again, I think that sort of wraps around nicely, doesn't it, to putting yourself out there in the world. Yeah. And yeah. as a researcher, she talks uh, or she started uh, researching shame and then she, you know, did a lot of work around vulnerability and, you know, a lot of work in helping people show up as authentic as, as who you are and just putting it out there. And it's, it, you know, our themes are kind of still all segueing very nicely because if you have those emotions, the breathings of your heart on the page, if you connect to the values and the the emotions that you live, then, you know, it's, as you said, you did your best or you did what you needed to do. If not, everybody likes it. Them's a the breaks. Find exactly. somebody who connects to you and who, you know, who you can work with. So yeah. Ab absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, them's the breaks. The only thing that matters <laughs> is being able to be comfortable with your own heart and soul. Yes. I think that's uh, yes. a quest I'm forever chasing because it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. No. Um, and, and the idea of feeling judged is always a challenge to get through life. And I think, you know, that imposter, uh, the imposter sort of syndrome as well, where you feel like sometimes you find yourself in a situation where you, you try to, or you don't try, but some people convince themselves they don't belong or yeah. they're not worthy. And, and of course, then it's the natural thing to do is to try and compensate for that irrational thought, which we're all victim of. Mm -hmm. And then you, maybe authenticity gets pushed to the side to feel like you belong. But at the end of the day, we're all in the same crazy world, yes. <laughs> I think. <laughs> and, you know, the adults aren't really the smart ones in the room. All yeah. the best we can do is huddle together with people of similar um, passions of the heart and, yep. you know, and investigate themes together and try and answer that elusive question of why we're here. And I don't think anyone's worked that one out just yet. Mm. And if somebody says they have, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe give it a bit before you agree. Yeah. <laughs> nah, but wonderful three quotes. Thank you. Yeah. You are most welcome. The other thing that I was going to mention, which is end of financial year, and uh, as it's you know creeping up on those of us in Australia, is that if you find, and you may or may not have it, it's been a, a tricky year for everybody, but you often at this time of year uh, get notifications from people to think about uh, donating to uh, organizations because this is a tough time of year for many of the not-for-profit organizations who haven't had the chance to use their volunteers or get out to do you know drives or fundraising events or those kind of things so that if you do have a little extra cash or even if it's something that you want to do regardless then you know maybe think about contributing to something like um, the Indigenous Literacy Foundation, for example, yes. which is one of the charities that I like to uh, support. The other one being the Australian Communities Foundation. I uh, am building up a fund to um, uh, share some, uh, donate some funds, some grants to uh, Very Special Kids, which supports kids with terminal illnesses and their families. But the Indigenous Literacy Foundation is a, is a great one and uh, very much lines up with supporting Australian authors. It's just a, a fantastic organisation and uh, well worth giving them any of your spare change or regularly donating to something. Have a look um, and see whether you like what they do. Yeah, so I think that's a really good thing to point out and uh, let people know about, absolutely. Because it's also tax deductible, people. <laughs> yes, and look, hey, you, I, I get it. You're on the way to Harvey Normans. You're thinking about grabbing a TV. Quickly check, realise yeah. he doesn't need any more Christmas bonus he doesn't. money. Turn the car around. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Do something that's going to be completely wonderful for absolutely wonderful people out there. Yeah, yeah. So indigenousliteracyfoundation.org.au and you know what they say is donate because reading is empowering and they, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. It's yeah. a fantastic organisation. That's completely unscripted, of course. I am. I must actually get in touch with them, see if they would like to come on to the show. Yeah, absolutely, and we'll, and we'll definitely put a link in the show notes. Um, yeah. And my comment about uh, Mr. Harvey was also unscripted because, I mean, obviously, no one in that position is going to take advantage of government money that should go out to more vulnerable <laughs> people. So <laughs> it's obviously unscripted and in. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> but the world's completely logical, uh, isn't it, Veronica? I'm oh, sure it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, 
Yes, yeah, so no. not. So not. Books feel a whole lot safer when we start to talk about this kind of stuff. All right. Well, so. yes, why we have books because uh, the media, <laughs> slightly, you know, we just had a YouTube star get arrested here in Australia, um, uh. which is a whole different thing. So come on, people, let's make sure that books, they're not coming for our books next. No. All right. So <laughs> we have to end our episode Absolutely. with a bit of a tagline. But before we do, if you enjoyed the episode, please feel free. And we would really love to see some stars or a few words of a review uh, on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform. Uh, really happy to see that. And what that means is not that it it feeds into, well, it does, it feeds into the algorithm that each of the podcast platforms has, but it means that our podcast is more likely to get in front of more listeners and we would love to share support for Australian authors uh, even more and get Australian readers reading more Aussie books so just sort of stick that one in Darren yes yes but... of course <laughs> yes ultimately the, the podcast we'd love people out there to visit the website and of course by visiting the website yes. you get to support awesome Australian authors and of yeah. course you get to uh, completely ignite your imagination with amazing tales there's yes. there's no losers in this there, there are none that's right <laughs> and if you're looking for us on social media on twitter we are at australian books because you can only get a short uh, name there but on facebook and instagram we are at australian book lovers and of course our website is australianbooklovers.com yes. uh, and so many different genres and uh, audience groups there that you can have a look and uh yeah jump on in that's about it okay i think it is time then isn't it yes so I'm going to lead us in and I'm going to say, do, 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 <laughs> get you going. So remember people to read, read more, more Aussie, Aussie books. books. Yeah, I didn't do the do, do, do at all, did I? But anyway, there we go. Yeah, the timing was getting there, I think, you know, we're almost at uh, record, professionally record level. No. Yeah, so not. <laughs> That'll be a single soon enough. <laughs> no. no, but thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Australian Book Lovers podcast. Hope you really enjoyed the what we presented to you today. And stay tuned because we've got a whole heap of episodes coming with a whole heap of wonderful guests. Indeed. In the meantime, Indeed. take care, everybody. And bye for now. Top End Girl by Miranda Tapsell. A thoughtful, honest and hopeful memoir. This was a dream to read with the joy and energy of the author evident in the friendly, funny and furious stories she shares. It read like she could have been sitting beside me, telling the tale over a cuppa. Tapsell entertained, enlightened and educated everything I want in a book. What an amazing and strong Larrakia woman a beautiful role model and a challenge to all of Australia to embrace. This was a delightful mix of her childhood, family and career. I saw Top End Wedding, the movie, before I picked up this book and absolutely love seeing the beautiful Top End in a rom-com. I've admired Tapsell's acting work and now I can add her authorship to that bag. A wonderful education in what it means to be a talented, passionate and artistic Aboriginal woman who is a success in whatever world and culture she happens to be in. A great read. Let's meet again. Where magic happens. Australian Book Lovers acknowledges First Nations peoples and recognises their continuous connection to country, community and to culture. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and honour the sharing of traditional stories passed down through generations. We're committed to a safe and inclusive welcome for authors and readers of all cultures and backgrounds including people of LGBTQIA communities and their families.